Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. Good evening, great to have your company. Welcome to the program. Here's what's coming up tonight on Credlin. A reality check for green fantasists. The New South Wales government now forced to spend millions of taxpayers' money extending the life of the Yararing coal-fired power station. Demonising coal's got us into this mess. Now the poor old taxpayers are hit yet again. Still on the issue of green madness, another blow today to a multi-billion dollar gas project in Narrabri. The federal court ruling that the native title tribunal that gave it all the go-ahead didn't look carefully enough at climate change. Honestly, at this rate, why would you invest in Australia? Plus, how is it the PM would rush to Sam Kerr's defence before he even knew what she said? And now we know what it is, allegedly, that she said. I can't help but think if this was any other racial slur, we wouldn't be hearing from the Prime Minister. And a very special guest a little later in the program, Constantine Kisson, a true defender of Western liberalism. He's been touring Australia and along with Tony Abbott, got to see firsthand just how intolerant the left has become in this country of free speech. Tony Abbott, go to hell! Take the liberals there as well! If I know Tony Abbott, the more noise they make, the more he would have enjoyed all of that. But first, if you suspect your power bills are rising because government policy is pulling in different directions at the same time, well, you'd be dead right. And here are two instances today in the news. First, it's reported that the New South Wales government, as I said, is in discussions with the power giant Origin to keep open the country's biggest coal-fired power station beyond its current planned closure date of August next year. We are, of course, talking about the Araring power station in the Hunter Valley. And such is the reality of how unreliable renewables are to a 24-7 modern economy like ours that the Minns government's forced to do this even though Labor is committed to a 50% emissions cut by 2030. And the second problem today is yet another example of lawfare getting in the way of development. In this case, the federal court has just placed further obstacles in the way of gas giant Santos and stopping them opening their Narrabri gas field, which is, of course, in New South Wales, because the native title tribunal supposedly failed to consider the climate impact of this project, even though gas is roughly half the emissions of coal. Now, is it any wonder that energy policy is a slow motion train wreck? The prices have been skyrocketing, that widespread blackout, blackouts are now a real risk or reality if you live in Victoria, and that heavy industry is moving overseas to places that don't have our emissions obsession. Just think what's been happening over the past decade or so. Instead of being run to produce affordable and reliable electricity, our power system's been run to reduce emissions. There's been billions and billions spent in massive government and consumer subsidies for wind and solar power that only gives us electricity when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining, which has therefore, of course, destroyed the economics of gas and coal-fired power that we desperately need to keep the lights on. So now, because we need power 24-7, governments are being mugged by reality and are forced to subsidise coal-fired power stations to keep them operating. The same coal, of course, that they demonise day in, day out. There's the still secret subsidies in Victoria. Subsidies are given to the coal-fired power stations in the Latrobe Valley to keep open the state's aluminium smelters. There's the temporary subsidy to coal producers that the federal government's also giving to artificially deflate power prices to consumers. And soon there'll be a further Victorian government-style secret subsidy that the Minns government in New South Wales will pay to Iraring to avoid widespread blackouts in coming summers. In other words, we're subsidising renewables to reduce emissions and, as a result, We've made coal and gas uneconomical, so now we're forced to subsidise them too just to keep the lights on, even though that means higher emissions. 
Now, it wouldn't always have been less crazy to have avoided subsidies in the first place and to have just let the power companies upgrade their coal-fired power stations in the normal course of business that would have eventually reduced emissions by some 40% because newer coal-fired power stations are more efficient, cleaner and lower emitting than old ones. Now, all of this was common sense. It was a sort of arguments that were made back at the time, but rejected by Labor and all the climate zealots in Canberra. And not just those on the green left side of politics either. Plenty of mad greeny moderates inside the Liberals as well. If reducing emissions really was the key objective here, we'd already have nuclear power under consideration because it is today the only way to generate baseload power 24-7 that's entirely emissions-free. Those same whackers that want to ban coal and gas also want to keep the ban on nuclear, which is why we're in this costly and confused mess. Even the usually smart Labor MP Andrew Charlton was brought in to try and run down nuclear. The truth is that the market has made its decision about nuclear energy. It knows that nuclear energy is by far the most costly type of new energy that we could add into the grid. And that's why it's not part of the government's plan. Yeah, come on, Dr Charlton, you are far better than that. It is total BS that the market's made its decision on nuclear. There is no market on nuclear power in this country because it's banned. And it's banned because your government has banned it and is keeping it banned. So don't insult our intelligence by just reciting some stupid talking points that a staffer handed you before you sat in front of the camera. But beyond nuclear, we don't even have other sensible options. We've got the activists holding sway. Like this federal court decision today, where activists have used native title rules to sabotage fossil fuel projects, even ones like gas, that would actually get emissions down. Now, my theory in all of this is that very powerful players have invested heavily in renewables. So that, they don't want any other option explored because follow the money, it would cripple their investments. Now, to my mind, this has never been about the planet. It's always been about the first mover advantage. They picked wind and solar, invested heavily, creamed off all the subsidies, and now don't want anything else on the table, even if it's better like nuclear, to reduce their profits. Finally, though, finally, at least the coalition seems to be moving towards a rational energy policy. The sad news is that's still at least an election away. All right, let's get the headlines now. Some very sad news too out of Canberra, but we'll get the headlines. Tom Connell. The Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher, has today unveiled a plan to pay superannuation on Commonwealth paid parental leave. The plan will come into force for all babies born after July the 1st next year. It means those who receive paid parental leave payments of about $900 a week will get an additional $106 paid into their super. The minister announced the plan as she launched Australia's first national strategy to achieve gender equality. You paid super on your sick leave, you paid super on your annual leave and there is no reason why it shouldn't be paid on paid parental leave too. The government values the work that women do caring for children and we don't believe they should be penalised with financial insecurity and retirement just because of those caring roles. The changes will need to pass through Parliament. The opposition is yet to decide if it will support or oppose the plan. But we also need to see this additional cost structural adjustment which it will be, to our budget at this particular time. It comes as Facebook's parent company, Meta, could face huge fines for effectively refusing to continue to pay for news in Australia. The tech giant walked away from commercial deals with Australian news outlets last week. The deal's worth about $250 million a year for Australian news publishers were due to expire later this year. A fine for Meta would depend on which sections of the code it breaks. The very least that an organisation like Meta could do is pay for the content that it uses. Particularly the regional newspapers that our country towns really rely upon, making yeah. sure that they've got the resources that they need to do to produce the news that they need to produce. 
And in sad news, the son of former Defence Minister Joel Fitzgibbon has died after his parachute failed to properly deploy during a training exercise at the RAAF Richmond base in New South Wales. Lance Corporal Jack Fitzgibbon was taking part in what's been described as a routine drill for Special Forces training on Wednesday night. He was taken to hospital but died this morning. We are devastated and heartbroken by the loss of our wonderful Jack. Serving in the Special Forces was Jack's dream job and we take some comfort from the fact that he died serving his nation in the uniform of the Australian Defence Force. Look, before I get into the headlines, I just want to send my deepest sympathies to that former Labor Minister, Joel Fitzgibbon, of course, to his family, but I think more broadly to the Labor family. That news is tragic. The death there of son, his son, Lance Corporal Jack Fitzgibbon, killed in a parachuting accident during Special Forces tra training. I can't imagine the sort of hell they're living through right now. I think it's incredibly sad, and they're in my thoughts and prayers tonight, as I am sure they are in yours. All right, joining me now for the headlines and more, Deputy Executive Director at the Institute of Public Affairs, Daniel Wilde, and the Australian's media writer, Sophie Ellsworth. Well, welcome to you both. We'll start with paid parental leave. Uh, $250 million today on the table. The scheme costs billions. It's paid for as a social security benefit, so it's not based on a woman's actual wage. It's like welfare. Um, but they're adding superannuation in. So... On top of the billions, $250 million announced, of course, by the Finance Minister, Katie Gallagher. But, but what really struck me in that speech today, Sophie, was the fact that she's saying from here on in, you're not going to get a government contract if you're a business unless you've got gender targets. Now, some people might say, well, OK, fair enough. But what about if they have race targets? What if they require people to have X number of uh, transgender staff on there to be diverse or Aboriginal staff in a company if that's going to be where this thing ends up? Well, Peter, this is just another burden, I believe, for businesses that have to meet these targets. And I think it removes the fact that shouldn't they be employing people who are good at their jobs, uh, not box ticking? And I think this will be a concern for a lot of employers, you know, who now think, OK, have we got so many men, so many women, so many transgender? That's going to be an impact. Uh, and also back to the super amounts that they're going to pay on the paid parental leave. Today, they were unable to really explain the cost involved. It's still not really known. So that's another uh, thing that the taxpayers are going to have to pick up. So I think there's a lot of things that remain uh, unclear here. I feel sorry for poor old business though. They're the mm. ones paying the taxes and they're being bullied by government with the money they pay as taxes coming back the other way. That's right, Peter. And this is just another thing. With all the criteria they have to meet, with all the red tape they have to work through, mm. yet another thing that they have to meet. But this is what, you know, you get under Labor. They introduce these uh, rules and laws and this is what the consequences are. They have to meet these targets. Daniel, we, we know now it's been confirmed there were people inside UNRWA, uh, the UN agency that provides aid or supposed to provide aid to Palestinians, uh, that were involved in the atrocities on October 7. That is without dispute. There's been a debate in the parliament. Of course, there's been a pause now by the federal government on paying out Australian money to UNRWA. But there's been a debate led by people in the Teal movement that we should resume the funding. I am concerned with these comments from the Prime Minister. Have a listen. Oh, we haven't got the grab, but the Prime Minister's basically come out and said, oh, I've got an open mind, it's all under review and we don't rule it out being resumed. Now, we should never give another dollar to UNRWA. Absolutely, we shouldn't, Peter. Uh, as you said, they've been implicated in atrocities. They have... Uh, had their funding implicated in funding Hamas. They've had their funding implicated in going to schools which have been teaching anti-Semitic content. Mm -hmm. So no Australian dollars should be going uh, to this UN organisation. The other thing, Peter, is you use the term teal movement, and that's exactly right. They claim to be independents, but every single one of those teals signed the letter to Foreign Minister Penny Wong demanding that they reinstate the funding. And what this shows is that the teals are nothing more than just cashed up greens that are protecting the inner city coveted interests of the elites. They want to talk about integrity. If they want to show integrity, they should refuse to have the word independent 
next to their name at the next election and put mm. Teal Movement or Teal Party because they're all acting as one on this, on Net Zero, on the Voice to Parliament. They all think the same. They all speak the same. Uh, you're not wrong. Teal's in better clothing. Green's in better clothing. I like that line. <laughs> hey, um, Samantha Kerr, the Aussie football star, right? Uh, she allegedly has racially abused someone. Before we knew the substance of what she said, the Prime Minister, straight out of the bat, came out and supported her. Have a listen. I will say this about uh, my contact with Sam Kerr, who was our flag bearer at the coronation. Uh, I think uh, my contact with her was exemplary. Uh, she did Australia proud uh, at that time. And uh, I think that um, you know, my contact with her has been nothing but delightful. Now, can you imagine anybody else getting that sort of leave pass from the Prime Minister before we even know what she said and to whom? We now know she allegedly said the words uh, to a cop, a policeman, um, stupid white bastard. Well, have a, have a listen to this academic this afternoon on Sydney Radio who says this. So stupid white bastard doesn't pass the threshold. Of what? Racism. Of racism? Mm, uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, um, Sam Kerr is, is charged with racially aggravated harassment, right? So I agree with you that the harassment part is actually a bit ridiculous. But it's, I'm not disagreeing that it's racial. But we have to make a difference between racial, because she said white, so there's a reference to race, but it's not racist. So basically, you can't abuse someone with a racial term if they're white. But what about the Prime Minister going out there to bat for her? I mean, any other time race is mentioned, you slap down, but not when it's Sam Kerr. Oh, absolutely, Peter. And look, Sam Kerr is the Australian sporting golden girl. Uh, you know, with her success with the Matildas, she's one of the best female footballers in the world. Uh, she's a hero to a lot of Australians. And I think when this news broke on Tuesday morning, people were very surprised that it had been kept under wraps for so long. But I'm surprised the Prime Minister would come out, you know, saying these things about her when we still don't know, Peter. We've still got the court case to go ahead. Uh, and I, you're right. I just can't see if this was a white uh, sportsman racially vilifying someone of colour... I cannot see that the Prime Minister... Now, I don't know, but I can't see that the same uh, pleasantries would be given. We talked last night about the voice in the South Australian Parliament, roundly rejected by South Australians, but, you know, the Premier's just motoring along. What did you make of the news last night that the Melbourne City Council, they are going to have a voice to council, a voice to the Melbourne City Council, if you can believe it, not the core business of the council. But what worries me, Daniel, is these are going to mushroom now right around the country. Every council in the country is going to want their own voice. Well, that's right. I mean, this is the lowest performing, wokest, most divisive councils in the nation. And the Mayor and the Deputy Lord Mayor have overseen the complete economic and social dismantling of this city. Mm -hmm. To their eternal shame, they supported Daniel Andrews and the lockdowns. This city has the worst homeless problem in the nation. It's got a crime problem. It's got a drug problem. It's got businesses that are closing down at a faster rate than any other capital city. Yet they're engaging in this divisive, woke identity politics. Sure, those who reside in Melbourne voted yes to The Voice, but Melbourne is not just a city for those who live here, it's a city for all Australians, those who work here but don't live here, those who come here for sport and cultural events, those who are tourists who visit the city. And what the Melbourne City Council is yet again showing is that this is a city not for all Australians, but only for the inner city elite, and only new leadership is going to fix the problem of this failed city. I can assure you I live in the uh, Melbourne City Council area and I was one of the few people who voted a big no. <laughs> anyway, um, Tony Burke, the minister, $58,000 spent on the taxpayer coin in four days in the United States. The bloke has form. He goes overseas with his then chief of staff, now his wife, a few years back, spends close to $50,000 on this fantastic first-class sort of European jaunt. He's now being called Tony Perk, not Tony Burke. Uh, the usual sort of champagne socialist you get when uh, money's thrown at these Labor types. But Bronwyn Bishop, 
who famously was inside the rules when she took her helicopter, but certainly outside the pub test, helicopter ride all those years back. It cost her a job as speaker. She said he must pay this money back. She did, of course. I reckon she's right. Well, Peter, isn't it interesting how you say she was inside the rules, Bronwyn Bishop, yep. but uh, it didn't pass the pub test? I think here this does not pass the pub test. Uh, yes, the US currency to the Australian currency is shocking. Oh, that's uh, not an but excuse. That is not an, I was just going to say, Peter, that is not an excuse. That is an awful lot of money to spend. Business class flights, really, you would think, in a cost of living crisis, the minister would think, where can we cut costs here? Can we fly cheaper? Do we need to go business? Business. Could we perhaps perhaps go economy this time and Did look he need at to take a staffer? Exactly. So I think uh, this is very bad look for him. If they're you know crying out to the Australian public saying we understand what you're going through, and he's splashing tens of thousands of dollars on a four day trip, I think this won't sit well with the Australians. What about this issue with an Adelaide soccer football player? Um, put a post up about the Pride round. I think it was for the A League for the soccer league. Um, and said, you know, above all, he remains a Muslim or he's a Muslim first. Got a lot of pressure and blowback from, from sport organisers over this. Now, it reminds me a lot of Israel Folau. It does. And I think it gets to the point, Peter, that this is what happens when sporting codes, in, sporting codes inject politics into their sport. People are not always going to agree with their zeitgeist. And we're seeing this happen yet again. And now Israel Folau got much different treatment from the media. But the principle is basically the same, that you're going to have people, either players or spectators or sponsors, who don't agree with certain politically correct narratives or rounds that these sporting codes are hosting. And Australians have just fed up with sports and big businesses getting involved in politics. And to me, it's just another example of why sporting codes should stick to sport. It should bring Australians together. Australians go to sport to get away from politics, not 100%. to be preached at. Sport has always been you know, critical to our social glue and foundation in what is otherwise a fairly disparate society. So I think it's just another example of the sporting coach. Just stay out of it. Now, I know they're waiting for regulatory approval, but Virgin, if it gets it, will put pets on mm. planes, only if they can fit in a little container like little pets. We're not talking about, you know, an Alsatian dog or a Great Dane, but Sophie, for it against it. Oh, if Hendrix, your little dog Peter, was sitting beside me, I'd be OK. But it depends on the pet, doesn't it? Yeah. And if the pet's not rowdy. I mean, they do do this overseas. I think Australians were warm to it, but initially, I don't know if people will like it. Daniel, how's a, how's a dog different than a screaming baby, maybe? Well, yeah, as that's, a no father, reason, as that, a father. that's no reason to make it worse, though, Peter, I'd say. So, look, this uh, my view, look, I understand people want to take their pets, fair enough, but there's enough delays and chaos at airports at the moment. I'm not sure about this one. Oh, I'm definitely in a dog camp. I can't <laughs> wait to take my little man on the dog, on the, on the plane, on the plane. Of course, it takes me away from Qantas, which is not a bad thing. All right, I'll leave it there. After the break, green lawfare holding up billions of investment, not to mention costing Australian jobs. Plus, the PM's office tried to bat away those questions about this looming car tax and concerns from the Thai Prime Minister this week. Well, now we find out that the story is changing yet again. Welcome back to come. The serious impacts of unchecked migration into the United Kingdom. Can we expect to see the same thing happening in Australia soon? But first, there's been yet another blow to Santos's Narrabri gas project, with two out of three federal court judges ruling in favour of an appeal against the $3.5 billion program. It was back in 2022 that a native title tribunal approved the development determining that the interest outweighed environmental concerns. There was an appeal, and now in this most recent judgment, the federal court has determined that the tribunal didn't, you won't believe this, didn't give enough consideration to climate change. So it's now back to the drawing board. The project goes back to the tribunal, and it will hold up billions of dollars, not to mention jeopardising jobs. For more on this, I'm joined now by the Australian's environment editor, Graham Lloyd. So take us through the judgment here. I, I'm right to reference this climate change, I guess the allegation is, of oversight by the tribunal, Graham. And, I mean, given this pro project is already being held up, it's a long way over budget and over time, what's it mean for its future? 
Well, good evening, Peter. Certainly the Narrabri project in the Pilliga Forest uh, is one that the environment movement has been dead set against for a long period of time. It's been a decade now that uh, arguments and challenges have been mounted to it. Uh, the latest ruling from the federal court is that not enough attention was paid by the Native Title Tribunal uh, to whether the project would impact those native title rights. Uh, the court didn't make a decision on whether it would or not or what should be done about it, uh, but it's really passed it back to the tribunal where they will have to be re-litigated. Uh, of course, uh, environment groups and those who have sponsored the hearing will be hoping that they'll get a decision to say that native title rights are impacted. Uh, and if that is made as a precedent, you can expect it to be rolled out against all other projects uh, as they are put forward. I mean, this isn't the only project that's being held up with Green Lawfare. Even when the project gets the go-ahead and passes all its hurdles, it's subjected to decades in the court. A lot of companies can't afford to fight it in the courts. A lot of the activists, of course, are funded by uh, shadowy players around the edges or indeed, the, the, you know, the Commonwealth taxpayer. Why on earth would you invest in Australia? I mean, capital could go anywhere in the world... Why wouldn't you take a project to, to dig up uh, coal or uh, mine gas anywhere but here? Well, if you look at the, the lawfare that's being uh, sort of rolled out around the place, we had a big uh, decision in uh, the, the Northern Territory recently about a pipeline where that was frustrated uh, and eventually moved through. Uh, we have a similar situation in Western Australia with Woodside. Uh, the Conservation Foundation has a, a big uh, campaign and uh, court challenge against uh, Woodside on its Scarborough project, uh, basically saying it should not be allowed to proceed because of the impact it will have on the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, as you say, these things take years and years to resolve. Uh, they add risk and complexity to decision making. And we really are starting mm. to see uh, resource companies making decisions uh, that, uh, look, it's getting pretty tough to continue to do business here. And of course, Australia, that means jobs and means income to the bottom line in the federal budget sense. I mean, I think this stuff is crazy. And of course, gas uh, is lower emissions. But anyway, what about a raring? I mean, you and I have been talking about a raring. Well, we, we go back, we, we talked about Liddell, and of course, that closed. It was a debacle. A raring's 25% of power in New South Wales. It's due to close, I think it's August next year. They've clearly been mugged by reality in the Minns government. They're sitting down and negotiating with Origin to try desperately to keep it open. And, of course, they're going to have to pay through the nose to do that. I mean, subsidies to build up renewables. Renewables makes coal vulnerable. But we need coal to keep the lights on. So then we subsidise coal as well. I mean, it, it, this is just madness, Graham. Yes, and it certainly is that, that dance that you uh, sort of set out so well earlier in the program that uh, we're subsidising something and then subsidising the competition to make sure it's still there and and uh, the whole thing is a complete mess. Uh, we discussed that there, there's there's no prospect that uh, Araring can be allowed to close next year and the government's really on the hook to, uh, to keep it going in some way. And, and the big thing that's left unsaid is that the, the energy companies uh, that own the coal facilities, they also own the renewable energy projects and other things, and they make a lot of money out of chaos in the system. Uh, there's a real uh, thing that can be, you know, said that uh, there was no plan when the decarbonisation started to uh, be implemented, and that's really to the great shame of uh, the politicians and the political class that's allowed it to get to this point. I can tell you, having been there at Canberra at the time, a lot of good people were yelling out that this was crazy and that they had no plan B, that all of this would happen. It's happening now. I don't have any comfort in saying that we were right, but, I mean, it's just shocking. Uh, just before we go, the, the Prime Minister yesterday said that the Thai Prime Minister didn't raise Labor's vehicle emissions debacle at the ASEAN meetings. But an account from the Thai government said, no, the issue was raised... Now, I don't know who's telling the truth here. I suspect it's probably the Thai government, not our own Prime Minister's <laughs> office. But, but surely this has to be rethought if it's going to start to not only impact consumers buying utes and SUVs in Australia, but also our international trade. 
Yes, yeah, so this is really all playing into the hands of a certain group of car suppliers and, and it's designed to transfer uh, the costs from those who want to buy what are now very expensive vehicles uh, to those who are, are buying less expensive vehicles but don't have as much environmental performance. Uh, the Thai government or the Thai industry exports about 200,000 cars a year to Australia. Uh, predominantly they are the sort of pickups and, and what have you uh, that are at the high end of emissions and there's the sort of cars that Australians want to buy. Uh, so there's no real opportunity in that industry to uh, really swap the profile over to low emissions cars uh, because they're really selling us the ones we want and uh, they're the ones that are going to be penalised. Well, I hope they, they hope they see some sense, Graham, before it gets uh, nasty. I'm not giving up my diesel SUV. I have to take the keys out of my dead hand. Thank you for your time. All right, after break, a very special guest joining me who has consistently called out the creeping illiberalism in the West. He's finishing up a sellout tour of Australia. He'll join us to give us his observations on how much trouble we're in or can we turn it around? I hope we can. Or are we as woke as the rest of the West? Welcome back. My next guest has been a consistent voice in calling out the corrosive nature of illiberalism that's taken over much of the West with its emphasis on identity politics, the cancel culture, and our growing reluctance to engage with any view that might be different, let alone one that might cause offence. Not only is he willing to speak out in defence of the West, but he does so in a wonderfully sardonic way that's built him a legion of fans and silences, or at least confounds his critics. He's got a Jewish and Russian heritage, a British upbringing, and experience as a comic which makes constant kissing impossible to pigeonhole. Now, I had the pleasure of having dinner with him last week in Melbourne while he's out here for sold-out shows across the country as a guest to the Centre for Independent Studies and the Institute of Public Affairs. He was just so impressive when I met him, and I'm delighted to say, on the back of that, he agreed to join me here tonight. Constantine, thank you for your time. I'm thrilled to have you on my program. Um, I want to ask you now, it's been a week since we caught up. You've had a chance to get around the country. You've been speaking to thousands and thousands of Australians. I'm keen to hear some of your observations. I mean, what do you think is the biggest challenge we face and how do we address it? Well, first of all, I've really enjoyed my time in Australia. And uh, somebody asked me what my take on Australia is. And I, I, my, my view is it's a country that looks like America, full of British people who aren't miserable. Uh, so I've had a really nice time meeting people, talking to them. Um, but I think it's a kind of good news, bad news scenario. I think uh, the good news is that you're not anywhere near as far down the slippery slope as many other countries in the Anglosphere, including my own, the UK, the America, Canada, etc. Uh, but I also think you are, the bad news is you are on the same trajectory. So uh, there is really no room for complacency. Do you think we realise where we're headed, though? I mean, you know, you and I, we both observe what's happening in other countries. But do you think the average Australian knows how bad it could end up and realise they've actually got a chance to do something about it? You know what? Honestly, I don't know because the people who come to my shows obviously are aware of the situation, are aware of what's going on, and many are very concerned. But I also think it's probably quite difficult when you live in such a great country with great weather, uh, you're having a, a, a good time of it, to, to be aware of these things and to be, uh, uh, you know, rightly concerned about the direction the society is going. Uh, but I, I do think that the people are starting to realize that some of the, the latest changes uh, that are happening from from the progressive end of politics are not conducive to a healthy uh, united society. And I think people are starting to wake up to that fact. Some of the politicians in this country, and I, and I have to say even those on the right, they want to say that culture wars don't matter. And the previous Prime Minister uh, he's not a conservative, but he's certainly on the centre right. Scott Morrison said, you know, I don't care about woke, woke doesn't matter. What would you say to that? 
Well, it doesn't matter if you care the, about the culture war. The culture war cares about you. The culture war is about teaching your children to hate their own society. It's about teaching uh, a false version of history in the UK, in America, here in Australia. It's about undermining the pillars of the West that have made it as successful as it is. And this is one of the things that I've been speaking with people about while I've been here in Australia, trying to say to people, look, uh, you have a great country here, and uh, if you don't need to take my word for it or your own word for it, just look at the direction of travel. People are coming from outside of Australia here. People are coming from outside of the United States to the United States and risking their lives in many cases. Likewise in the UK, likewise in Europe. And there's a reason for that. We have created very, very good societies, societies that are good at creating safety and prosperity, which is the thing that human beings seem to care about. And let's remember how that happened. It happened because we have government by consent. It happened because we have freedom of expression that allows us to produce technological and scientific breakthroughs that are unparalleled around the world. Uh, and uh, we have the ability uh, to leverage those uh, scientific developments and technological progress through the method of capitalism, whereby because we've created an incentive structure where you keep what you create instead of having it taken away from you by an authoritarian corrupt government or a communist system or whatever else it might be, we have generation upon generation of entrepreneurs and scientific leaders who allow us to be prosperous and successful and safe. So let's not throw any of that in the bin. Let's not pretend, as people are now pretending, that freedom of expression is somehow a partisan issue. I grew up being someone on the left uh, and with, with the understanding that one of the core principles and the pillars of Western society is our freedom to speak our minds. And I feel that that is something that's been under threat. Look at, you know, our, our what our children are being taught about capitalism. They're being taught that the idea of creating capital is bad. In the UK, we recently had a debate of whether mm. a, a person was too rich to be prime minister. Uh, and it, it just seems to me that we're going in the wrong direction. Talk to you about Islamism. I mean, how big a threat is that to the West? We, we watch here in Australia what's happening in the UK, um, particularly after October 7, we've certainly had some very troubling incidences here. But we've also seen what has happened. I mean, I use the past tense there in Belgium and France. I think they're, I think they're very far gone. Do you reckon we have our eyes open on this issue? Well, Islamism is a problem not only in the West, it's actually a problem in the Muslim world too. One of the things that's happened, and you see it show up in the scenes that we saw in Parliament in the UK a couple of weeks ago, is essentially we have imported the civil war that is raging within the Muslim world, uh, where people who want a caliphate and who want Sharia law are fighting against people who want to live in nation states. And they're Muslims, they're socially conservative, but they have no intention of creating a, a, a tyrannical, authoritarian, religious uh, borderless society like the caliphate that some of these people want. And so uh, what you saw in the scenes that we had in Parliament a couple of weeks ago is essentially that the mm. Islamist tail is now wagging the Labour dog uh, and is able to intimidate and threaten British parliamentarians into changing the, uh, the rules by which they operate. This is very dangerous. Uh, we obviously saw the, the horrific scenes after October 7th uh, here where I'm sitting not far from here in Sydney. Um, and I think people need to be aware that uh, we can welcome people from all over the world, Muslims and Christians and people of many faiths. But when there are extremists among them, we have to be very careful uh, to protect not only ourselves, but actually the Muslim community in this country and in Britain and in America from the extremists who would, you know, very often when there's a terrorist attack ha that, that is committed by an Islamist happens, people say, well, Muslims are the biggest victims of terrorism. And it's true. And the reason is that these terrorists are extremists in that community who are killing their own people as well as the rest of us. So we've got to be very aware of this, uh, this poison in our society, for sure. Talk to me about the issue of uh, trans women, uh, transgender particularly, but it, but it really targets women because it's at the expense of biological women. I know you've spoken out about it. It's a feature of the things I talk about here in Australia. And it, it increasingly, women feel, I think quite justifiably, that we're being erased I know there has been some pushback on this, but, but you know, we've got issues with the surgeries and hormone treatments for children. Uh, we've got the inability to even question some of this madness. Do you think the world's waking up here as well? 
I think slowly but surely people are waking up. And I think most people's immediate reaction when they're being asked about you know, trans women, most people just want to live their lives. It's not something they want to get involved in. It's obviously a highly toxic debate and polarized, etc. cetera. But, uh, and, and I've never really wanted to wade into it other than to say I think some of the things that are happening are absolutely atrocious. Uh, it's not something I'm interested in as a, as a debating point or as a conversation. But the fact is uh, children are being encouraged to mutilate their bodies without fully understanding what they're being invited to do. Uh, and uh, women are being put in danger. We had a case uh, in Scotland, in the UK, where a, a man who was a rapist was put in the women's prison because he, he, he got a, a bout of what I, call, what I call prison onset gender dysphoria. When you, you turn up in a courtroom accused of a sex mm -hmm. crime and suddenly, oh, you feel like a woman. Um, and, and uh, so all of these situations just are completely unacceptable. You mentioned female sports. On my show, Trigonometry, on YouTube, we interviewed Sharon Davis, a former British Olympic medalist swimmer who's very concerned about this issue. Uh, and it's an issue of simple fairness. I think we live in a society where we're actually quite uniquely positioned around the world in terms of making sure that women have equal rights to men and equal opportunities to sport and access to all sorts of things. I don't think we want to be eroding those things in order to appease a few people who, uh, who want to claim that they are entitled to it because they identify in a different way. Uh, the simple fact of it is your biological reality determines the fact that you have an unfair advantage over women when it comes to sport. Uh, and we should respect women's right to compete against women. Constantine Kisson, I know you have a big audience here in Australia. I know you certainly have a big audience here on Sky News. So I am very grateful you found time to join me tonight. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And he's a lovely bloke personally as well. All right, after the break, maybe if teachers focus more on teaching and spent less time taking lewd photos, our education rates would be better. The Queensland calendar certainly caused storms up north. We'll get to that. So too these changes to let students appeal a suspension on the grounds that it hurts their human rights. You're kidding me. All right, still a lot I want to get you across tonight. Pauline Hanson's One Nation Chief of Staff James Ashby joins me. And Senior Fellow at the Menzies Research Centre, of course, the columnist with the Australian, Nick Cater, as well. Well, extraordinary scenes in the Victorian Parliament last night, James. Former Labor minister, still a parliamentarian though, Adam Sobirek, accused another former Labor MP. This is the federal MP, Anthony Byrne, who was once the best mate of Sobirek. Well, Byrne was accused of being the spy referenced but not named by the ASIO boss. Have a listen. President, we are also told by Mr Burgess that MP in question was close to a former Prime Minister and tried to compromise the former PM's family. Our next task is to investigate characteristics such as history of disloyalty, character, financial and psychological situation. President, Acting President Anthony Byrne certainly ticks all the right boxes here. Now, look, we don't have parliamentary privilege here on Sky, so let's be very careful with what we say. But um, Anthony Byrne is saying he's not going to comment on the matter. Uh, intelligence sources are saying, look, we're not, we don't, we're not sure, we're not saying that Byrne is, quote, the traitor. But is this what parliamentary privilege is for, James? Well, it's hard to say. And, look, I understand Somiak thinks he's got the, the man here, but none of us will ever know. As long as this man doesn't come out and say he's done it, uh, we have to treat him as innocent. But the one thing we do know about the Labor Party is... For decades now, they've been too close to the Chinese. So if it's not him, uh, there is uh, a resounding number of people within Labor that have had, you know, fingerprints all over deals done with the Chinese that are questionable. And so this is why the finger pointing is happening to so many different Labor people. Uh, I'd have to say, though, I think it's within everyone's interest, the Australian public, public's interest, plus those members of Parliament, actually reveal this person. If you can't charge them, let's reveal them so we actually know who it is, so we can stay well clear of them. I agree. If we can't charge them, I wouldn't mind a bit of public shaming for what they've allegedly done or what yeah. Mike Burgess says they have done against their own country. Nick, what do you make of this decision out of Queensland? I mean, this is extraordinary to me, that students will now get the right to appeal being suspended for bad behaviour after a government report found that uh, suspending kids breaches their human rights. Now, in my day, it wasn't just a suspension you copped, you also got the strap 
but I reckon they'd lock a teacher up for the strap these days. I mean, this is, well, what do you do with a disruptive student? If you can't suspend them, they end up dragging down and impacting the ability of every other kid to learn, don't they? Well, yeah, this, this just undermines the authority of teachers yet further. I mean, you know, as well as I do, you hear from teachers who really struggle with discipline in the classroom and because kids will try it on because there's no recourse. There's no, there's no consequence for bad behaviour. And, if, and if, if there's no consequence, then, you know, mischievous kids will, will, will disrupt the classroom. I think this is a terrible decision and just goes to this whole thing about human rights, which is a one-sided thing, right? I mean, what about the right of kids in schools who want to learn, who want some discipline yes. brought to the classroom so that they can learn? I might add there, I did not get the strap at school. I came close. I certainly got it at home, though. Yeah. Um, James, what about that calendar story out of Queensland? So you've got all of these teachers in a calendar in really sexualised positions, it ends up in the public domain. This calendar, though, was on full display. Kids could see it. I mean, how do you respect your teachers? It's making a mock there, mockery there of uh, Catholic nuns. I mean, surely parents have got a right to expect better than this. Well, sadly, the teachers, there are quite a number of conservative teachers still out there, Peter. They are getting on in age, um, which is a bit sad to see because they're the ones we want to keep in the school system. Uh, but I can't believe you thought those pictures were me when I sent those uh, images to you as well, by the way. Um, I will say this, though. It is disgraceful that parents have learnt that their kids were exposed to this. You know, some of the teachers from that school actually showed their grade 11 and 12 uh, students exactly what was in that calendar. Uh, they are smutty, they border on pornographic, and I'm sorry, but if you're a school teacher and if you want extracurricular activities after school or even through school, think about tutoring. Don't put out these sexually explicit calendars and think that no one's going to take objection to this. That classroom at Balmoral State High School, uh, the staff room, should I say, has actually lost a lot of teachers who don't want to be around these teachers who uh, were a part of the calendar. Uh, I believe there's more, more photographs yet to come and I think they'll be exposed next week as well. So oh, wow. watch this space. That story's not going anywhere. Nick, this fight that's going on between Facebook's parent company, Meta, and all the Australian news outlets, Meta used to pay for the content of shows like this to go out on Facebook. It's now saying it will not review those commercial deals. It's much bigger than just, you know, two big media companies or multiple media companies bluing with Facebook or Meta. This is about the public having access to credible journalism and basically good, solid news sites being deplatformed. When I mean, this was an issue during The Voice, what we got to see, what we got to hear, how concerned are you? You've been in the media for years. What, what do you make of it all? Uh, well, you know, the production of news is a very, very expensive business. It's, it's very labour intensive, as you know. There's no machines that can go around collecting up information and putting it in some order. I mean, you'd know from the Sky newsroom that, you know, there's a lot of bodies in there to produce what's coming out. And so, I think it's it's fundamentally unjust for a company like Meta to basically steal that content and then to thumb their nose at the Australian government. Meta made $180 billion in revenue last year, and that's far larger than, you know, any of the media companies here make. And uh, the consequence, of course, is if they're allowed to get away with this, is that it just diminishes journalism still further and just takes away because they're, they're attracting advertising of course they have a great uh, uh, mm. ability to attract advertising but they're attracting it with content that they've, they've taken so I hope the government the government does seem to be tough it really has to stand up to this I mean the Morrison government was a world leader in this but we have to back that up with some really tough measures now. James, just quickly, you're the first person that's raised this plan by Federal Labor for what's called a nature positive plan. No one else has raised it with me. I've done a bit of digging around. It is utterly terrifying. I know we're going to talk about it on and on and on, but if it, give us a sense of why it's a worry. Well, as you know, the EPBC Act took 10 years to formulate. Uh, it was passed through a realm of different organisations, state government, local council, um, 
environmental specialists and it was passed finally by a Liberal coalition government. It's not the best bit of ledge, I must say. It's, uh, you know, 1,100 pages, of, you know, this thick and it's difficult to navigate and it's been bastardised over the years as well. But what is happening with this Nature Positive plan, which is uh, before uh, the Labor Party, no-one else has seen this, I might just say. It's been uh, squirrelled away behind closed doors. They've had three meetings. This is going to mean detrimental impact towards new mining projects. We know in WA alone there's over $300 billion worth of mining projects in the pipeline that yet haven't been approved. Uh, we're missing out on $60 billion yeah. a year in uh, what should be going to, uh, to mining OK, I'm going to wrap it there. Mining, uh, environmental, it's all disastrous. I've got it. It's a disaster. We'll keep talking about it, but thanks. I wanted it to is. give you credit for raising it. Got to leave there, gents. Thanks for your time. That's it. I'll see you Monday at 6. Have a good weekend.